Well, I am Mike Lovett. I'm the program director. Also online is Dr. Laura Colopy, who is the senior teaching fellow. And then our education administrator is Lawrence Peffers. So we are the three people who are the admin team, but then there's dozens and dozens of module leads and lecturers and other people involved in the program in general. So our MSc uh, involves what you might expect from an institution such as Imperial, a interaction with world renowned researchers and teachers and leaders. Um, it is a blended teaching format. I'll get more into that in a few minutes, but what that really means is for most modules, which are one month long, uh, you have a face to face week and then a lot of online material, which is at your own pace, um, but uh, has very many different formats for your learning. We offer full time and part time options. So the full time option is a one year MSc starting in October, running through eight modules, eight months and then finishing up with a project. Uh, which is a three of three months duration. The part time option can stretch out over two or three years, and we'll get into that in a minute as well. We have partnerships with Brunel University uh, um, in, in the economic aspects of genomic medicine and with the Institute of Cancer Research for a module on cancer um, genetics and genomics. We have a very diverse cohort. Uh, both diverse geographically and diverse academically. So we have about maybe 25% of our students are healthcare professionals, some physicians, some nurses, many, many different uh, areas of, of healthcare, uh, midwives, all sorts of things. Uh, and then we have, a, uh, I would say now, the majority of our students are um, straight out of an, a BSc or an MSc uh, and want to pursue sometimes usually uh, a PhD and, and go the research route. We'll come to outcomes and what people do in a couple of minutes. Oops. So we offer three degrees depending on your interests and how you want to progress through this. Um, the vast majority of people coming in are doing a full MSc right from the start. Uh, you can do a, a postgraduate certificate, that's four modules. A diploma is eight modules. And then, as I said, the MSc is the eight modules plus a three month research project. So in terms of entry, we our minimum requirement is a 2-1. Uh, in a, a relevant background, but that relevance can be quite broad. If you've worked extensively uh, in genetics or genomics or something in healthcare, then we will look closely at that. Uh, so we accept a wide variety of um, international qualifications, but we do sometimes uh, submit special uh, considerations uh, for people who don't quite meet the, these 2-1 requirements. If you've done something and shown an aptitude uh, for genomic medicine, and also if you've done well in the interview, which we'll talk about in a moment. So all applications are submitted to the admission system, the central admission system. They don't come first to us, they go to the admission system. Then they are reviewed by our admissions team. And I would say that about and by our genomic medicine team. And I would say that about 10 to 20 percent of uh, of applications fail to make that hurdle. So maybe 80 or 90 percent of, of people move forward to an interview and that interview will occur with myself and Laura, Dr. Laura Colopy or with another faculty member. Um, and from that on a usual schedule, a usual year, about half of those applicants are accepted. Uh, you get notified of that outcome within about two weeks. So it's a fairly rapid project pro program uh, of admissions. Uh, once it passes our admissions team, it flows through us in a, probably about two weeks. 
This is a sort of overview. I'm not going to get into all the complexity of, of, the, of the year's timetable, but on the left here, you can see the fundamentals module, and that is the one that everybody must start on. And everybody for any degree, the CERT, the diploma or the MSc must have that fundamentals module. And then if you were doing this part time, you could sort of mix and match throughout the two years. But if you're doing it full time, you would fo follow from fundamentals onto omics, onto the, the, um, the, the next module. And then you'd have in January options and you could choose whether to do the ethics or the genomics and the patient. You can't do both. You've got to do one or the other. Then in March, you have another set of optional modules. In that case, four optional modules, and you have to choose one of those. And then at the end of that process, the end of May, you've actually accumulated eight modules. So every single one of these modules is a month long, and the vast majority of them are structured so the first week is what we would call scaffolding material online and you are learning a lot of stuff that you need for the discussion sessions and the journal clubs and the and the face to face week which is usually the second week that is mandatory face to face so in thinking about how you're going to follow through this program you have to budget that time to actually be at Imperial on the second week of each month. Now, you certainly can be at Imperial the whole time. We don't mind that at all, and we try to accommodate all of that. Uh, and you can be, uh, we try to also organize rotations through labs so that you get a, a sort of spectrum of experience in different areas. Uh, that's not formalized yet, but it does sometimes happen. So as it says on the left, three weeks of self-directed study, one week live face to face. And then at the end of that, in the at the end of the fourth week, you submit your assessment online, which is usually a critical appraisal of something or other um, it, in a sort of essay format. But it really comprises a lot of the material of the entire module. You submit that assessment and you are done for that module and you move on to the next one. So there's no overlaps between the, the modules. So as I said, you have elective modules, these optional ones in January and March, and you can only take one of these per elective group. And you have to tell us if you come into the program uh, early on, what optional modules you want to take so that we can do things like room bookings and make sure we've got enough people to teach it. Um, if you're doing this part time and if you are Health Education England funded, you would be doing it part time. Um, then you take the same modules as the full time MSc. You just take them at different times in, in terms of you take some in the first year and some in the second year and you can spread out your project over a much longer time period. So we frequently get asked for, about what is self-directed learning. Well, it's many, many things. It can, it's approximately 30 hours in each week, and that's sometimes online lectures, interactive uh, uh, courses, uh, some reading and research, and in all cases, in every module, the first week's content must be completed in advance or you struggle in the second week. So this is by no means MSc light. Uh, this is a real full force MSc that requires a lot of work on your part. It can be done by people who are in full time employment, and that's what happens with our healthcare professionals who are doing this course over a two year period. Uh, but you've got to have very good time management skills. Now, everybody uh, who wants to do the MSc has to do a research project. And that is a 14 week long project uh, which consists of uh, 
It can be a dry lab project. It can be a wet lab project. Pardon me. It can be a mixture of these things. It can be um, a literature review, but that literature uh, review has to be a substantial piece of research. It can't just be a review article about something that's been written again and again and again. You have to actually do something in a systemic way, a systematic way that um, that leads to insights in the field. Uh, all the research projects are assist by, assessed by a written dissertation that has about 80 percent. Oh, oh, pardon me, 80 percent. Off the mark and then an oral presentation, a 15 minute oral presentation that is 20 percent of the mark. And we are very flexible about where you do that project as long as we appoint a um, internal imperial supervisor, co-supervisor. And many people have done their projects at uh, Brunel, at Institute of Cancer Research, at the Crick Institute, and a few have done them abroad in uh, Japan or Hong Kong, sometimes in the States. So it's a, vi a very diverse and uh, and a very broad uh, series of research possibilities for you. Now, we are not paternalistic about assigning MSC research projects. You, with, the responsibility is yours for securing your research project, but we give you lots of options. So we release a, a list of projects each year, year and then we circulate that to all the students and then the students essentially go to talk to their PIs from the list. And you may also contact other experts in the field or lecturers in the course and and see if there are possibilities there. You can't just sort of jump into it with both feet and say, OK, I'm off and running. The proposal has to be approved and that approval isn't terribly onerous. Uh, it is to ensure that everybody's doing about the same amount of work and that it's real research and that it's not something that's already been investigated um, ad nauseum. So full time students, as I said, complete their project over 14 weeks from June till September and then they do their oral exa exam and then they are done. Um, part time students have up to a maximum of one year from start to finish for their research project, which gives them a lot more flexibility in how they use their time and, and, and how they conduct that project. All right, so what are the outcomes from our program? Well, um, a lot of people go on to do PhDs uh, and many of those actually come from their research projects, but we also help people in uh, achieving PhD places um, frequently in London, frequently in Cambridge and Oxford. Um, many of our students are a large proportion in terms of uh, uh, other programs go on to the uh, scientist training program, uh, which is for clinical uh, scientists. That's a highly competitive program, but we've had a lot of success there. And those people also come back and talk to our current cohort so that you know what to expect during that. We have a lot of industry connections and many of our people have come from industry or go into industry and uh, take up leadership positions in, in uh, uh, genomic medicine divisions. And we've had quite a lot of entrepreneurs. So um, venture capitalists and people who are interested in getting into getting uh, into the funding and the knowledge base of what genomics really does constitute and what it can deliver. And so that creates a really diverse and interesting group of students who interact very much. There's a lot of welfare and academic support at Imperial. We take it very seriously. Every single student will be assigned an academic tutor who takes care of your welfare and they're not connected to your program. They're there for if things go wrong or if you need help or advice. There's also a departmental welfare tutor and then there's great degree of college support and career services and counseling and any disability issues. 
We also, within the programme, have weekly drop-in sessions every Thursday in which myself and Dr. Colopy uh, devote time to giving you academic advice or pastoral support or any question that you might have. So it really it can cover the waterfront. There are various financial options. They're listed here for you to explore. There are also limited scholarship funds, which usually so that you can find it at these various URLs. But usually there's one or two of those scholarships available per MSC per year. So it's not a, a very uh, deep pot of cash, but I would encourage you to look into these other financial options. And then finally, I want to say something about HEE applications. So if you are a full time NHS employee, you're eligible, eligible for full tuition paid on uh, the MSC. Yeah. And this has to stretch out over two years. It is funded by Health Education England, and we are one of their preferred providers, one of the seven or eight in, in, in England. So we have guaranteed funding for a, a certain number of years, and that is split up into postgraduate certificate funding. They like to fund the certificate, and then if the person gets to the end of those four modules and wants to continue, they will countenance it going to a diploma. And that is what the vast majority of people in our program do. They go from a cert to a diploma to a full MSc. But it comes in four module increments of funding. The way this works is the application process goes as usual, just through the normal process, and you don't have to make any HEE application at that moment. Um, if you're successful in the interview, then you will probably be put on a waiting list. And that's because we are elevating people within our program first, and then we go and see how many applicants we can fund. And that is happening pretty much now. And we would, if you are on the wait list or you want to apply and become on the wait list, we will keep in close contact with you and let you know how the funding is developing. We have a very close relationship with HEE, so if you are accepted to us and we want to allocate funding to you, you go through an HEE application. And that really is not a big hurdle. It consists of explaining why you want to do genomic medicine in your professional context and getting the approval of your line manager for all the time it will take, mostly those face-to-face -face weeks. So that has, is a, a letter from your line manager saying to HE, yes, I'm fine with this. And then we liaise with HE, and they re receive an application form A from Imperial, and then there's a couple other forms, but it isn't a big bureaucratic piece of nonsense. It works quite well. Uh, we are very happy to talk to you in person about this. So, uh, And in fact, that goes for any applicants. Uh, just drop us an email if there are, are um, questions that you have about it. Now, now we're open for, um, for general questions from you. So please don't be bashful. Ask away. Good morning, Michael. Uh, good afternoon, as well. Uh, and Laura, how are you doing today? Very good, thank you. No, actually, um, my name is Ramya. Um, I have done my master's uh, in biomedicine in Institute of Child Health in 2009. Uh, because of my family, I I dropped out. I, I finished it. After that, I haven't done anything. Um, uh, after my master's. Um, recently, I have joined um, in NHS, but it is not uh, re related to uh, research, but I want to come back into um, genomic medicine. As I have done uh, projects in uh, bioinform 
proteomics and genomics when I was doing the PhD, uh, like a master research. Um, yeah. So I want to continue like I know it is a big gap, but uh, I'm pretty sure I can come back. But uh, at the moment, my position is uh, healthcare assistant is a uh, uh, health health role uh, is a permanent role. So am I eligible for uh, HE uh, application process? Yes, if you are a full time NHS employee in any respect, okay. so that does not mean you, you don't have to be a physician. You certainly do not have to be in research. OK, you just have to have a compelling story in terms of why you want to do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but y there's there's no bar in any sense to any subspeciality or, you know, we have many people who are in NHS labs who are, are working you know, as technicians, but mm. want to move into something else and, yeah. and we've trained them. So yes, you're you're eligible if you're a full time NHS employee. So so just need to go to the HEE website and see how it works. And uh, is there any deadline for it? No, for the... actually, you don't you don't have to go to the the HEE website at this juncture. Mm -hmm. the, the major thing is to get accepted by us. Right? OK. So okay. put put your application through Imperial, right? Uh -huh. And read read the stuff on our website, which hopefully okay. is now more more legible than it was before. We had a okay. yeah, um, a yeah. mess up in which it became difficult to see the stuff. Have a look at the HE stuff. If there if you do have questions about HE funding, please mm -hmm. get in touch with Lawrence, our administrator, Lawrence Peffers. Uh-huh. If you have specific questions about that, um, okay. then then as the process unfolds, you, you get interviewed by us. Mm -hmm. And then if we put you onto the hold list, then and if we then allocate uh, any of our funding to you, then we start the talk with HEE. OK, that's good. Right. And so it, it really becomes it becomes very, very simple for you. It's not it's not too difficult. Yeah. The main thing is I re because I, I have done a lot of uh, project work, you know, yeah, I have done uh, uh, work on uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, genomic anal mutational analysis and uh, C. difficile uh, uh, proteomic analysis as well. But uh, it's all uh, stopped uh, because I gave uh, time for my family. So now yes, again, I, yes. I started uh, doing I want to come back. Um, yeah, well, so, we, we and we understand that, and you know, and I have to say, when when you know, I started this program six years or so ago, and with a whole bunch of other people, it wasn't just me, but mm. um, the I was concerned that we were taking people from all sorts of you know different backgrounds, and how yes. would we get them all up to speed? In fact, yes. it has worked very very well. We yeah. have a a pre sessional, essentially removing the rust from your brain session, <laughs> which is not okay. for credit. And you take that as many times as you want during the summer. Yeah, and then you're up to speed for the fundamentals. That's so great. we un understand that. The other great thing is, you know, we've got lots of people from so many diverse backgrounds mm -hmm. that you actually have a lot of support from your from your cohort. Mm -hmm. And That's it really, it really helps a lot. About that. So don't worry about the, you know, oh, it's been a while. OK, it, it, OK, that, that's here. great. Uh, nice to hear from you. So I will try my best to communicate and uh, apply it through and see how it works. Yes, just put in the regular application. Yeah, but thank you so sure much. For yeah, when it when in the in the section of the form that mm -hmm. says, um, how do you intend to fund this? Mm -hmm. Make sure you say HEE. -E, OK, right? OK. That way we are alerted that you're an NHS applicant and we talk oh. to you about that, right? Okay. Oh, OK, OK then. Thank you so much for help. All right. Nice okay. meeting with you both. <laughs> you Bye. too. Yeah. OK, um, and I think we have somebody else with their hand up. Zayed? Yeah, hello. I apologize if there is a background noise around me, but I'm in a radiology conference at the moment. Anyway, I have uh -huh. two quick questions. I've read through the your general overview and I've been reading on the website, but I don't manage to see if there is any topics that covers cardiovascular, genomics, 
inherited cardiomyopathies? And if not, what about the thesis? Is that possible, like, to write a thesis or do research specific to cardiology, inherited cardiomyopathies? And thank you. Well, um, given the fact that we are the National Heart and Lung Institute, we would, you know, have a lot of projects on cardiomyopathies. It, our um, curriculum is a bit constrained by the requirements of HEE, and if we, I think, if we had our, our our freedom, you know, from that funding stream, we would quite possibly be offering a module on cardiomyopathies. After all, it's our speciality, along with respiratory. Um, but you you certainly can do a research project on it. Um, so, you know, the other thing that we, I would love to be offering is a module on neuropsychiatric disorders, which I think are the, you know, sort of the new frontier. But we can't do all of it, but we, you certainly would get the basics. And even within complex and inherited diseases, you will have people leading cardiologists, genetic cardiologists, giving talks there. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Nicholas. Hi there. How can we help? You're still muted. Uh, can you hear me? No. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. Um, first of all, thanks for the general presentation. Uh, a bit of context behind myself. I already have an offer uh, from you guys. I did the interview a few months ago and I had the pleasure of getting an acceptance. I just have a few questions, two questions regarding the course and one question regarding contact. Um, the first question is in terms of cohort mixing, uh, how like what is arranged from the program to allow for me as a new student for the course to get to know the other people in the course? Is there like an information? session or do we just like all turn up to the first lecture and expect and we're expected to just communicate between ourselves or it's a bit of both so you do get an information session you will get actually a postgraduate taught induction which gives you a lot of information but in that first face to face and Laura feel free to jump in here and correct me but we we believe that those face to face sessions are a great way of interactions and cohort building so what we tend to do is we sort of dump you into groups and people can be like oh my god you know i'm just i i wanted to just sit here anonymously in the room um and when you've got 60 or 70 people and you break them into six or seven groups or maybe 10 you start to get a lot of interaction and then you start to people and then you know another day will break you into other groups so everybody gets to know each other, and it's quite amazing the degree of social contact that results from that. Do you have anything to add to that, Laura? Uh, yeah, so sorry about the background noise. Um, I'm at South Ken and it's a bit crazy. Um, but yes, yeah, so in the first fundamentals teaching week, we have a couple of journal clubs and we have a debate, and each time we allocate them into groups that are different. So you mix up and you basically get to see and meet everybody and we hear from everybody. We encourage you to ask questions and it becomes quite friendly group and one of the things we also do is we um somebody volunteers to be student rep it's not it's quite informal somebody volunteers to do that and they tend to start a whatsapp group we put a qr code up on the screen everyone scans it and you're all in a whatsapp group and then it's a way to facilitate your communication um and i think very quickly people became um very friendly with each other they they supported each other um and they used that whatsapp group to probably complain about us a lot and it was very, <laughs> it was very, um, very nice to see that happening because they'll come back and say, oh, a couple of us on the WhatsApp have noticed this. Could you clarify this? And so we know that this communication is going on. And although it's a bit later, by, uh, by Christmas, by the third module, we had a social uh, that was catered. I don't know when or if we'll do that again, but it was um, a nice opportunity for everybody to interact and get to know each other a bit more. But um um we might do that at a different time this year i'm not sure but there are plenty of opportunities and especially in fundamentals we really do um try to mix you up a bit and get everybody talking and saying hello perfect perfect um my second question is regarding the exams so um it was mentioned in the presentation that each taught module is about one month long 
uh, I, I assume that the exams take place in the last week. Um, so what's the actual arrangement for exams? Is there like an official example or is it done informally in the lecture room or um, how's it done? No, it's done all online. It's on your own time. So there are no formal exams. There are assessments, all right? And we, and you know, it may sound really easy if you're told the assessment right at the beginning, you know, of the, of the teaching week. Oh, this is going to be a breeze, you might think, when you get told that you've got to write a critical review of the following thing and that that has to be handed in at the end of the fourth week. But it's not easy. It actually requires you to really be thinking about the whole thing the whole time. We give plenty of assessment briefings because we've learned that that actually is a helpful way of learning. Uh, we're not going to write the thing for you. And, you know, and now, neither is chat GPT because these things are big, uh, but it's about usually maybe 3000 word critical appraisal of a particular thing that grabs bits throughout the module. And then you write that and you submit that uh, before the end of the module and you move on into the next one unencumbered by an assessment now. I, I would have so the assessment, does. sorry, sorry. The, the assessment, um, there, some modules have an assessment where you have a presentation and then you write an essay or some have some short answer questions and some just have an essay overall um, and we try to uh, give different types of assessments because people have different strengths and learn in different ways. Um, but as Mike said, there are no like, invigilated exams. There are no timed assessments because that's just not an effective way to learn or assess somebody. Um, so it hopefully is a nice way to get the module over and done with and then and then move on. So theoretically, I could do this master's all online and never have to be in London, for example. That's no. Just a... no, if you don't attend the mandatory face to face one week, that each oh, right. then then there will be consequences. So, in in fact, just m losing a day there, you have to get permission from me and from the module leader. So it can't be you know I just don't feel like going in for these lectures today. Those interactions are extremely important. They're extremely important because we like to give you a lot of information prior to them so that you come into it already prepared to discuss. And those interactions are learning experiences in them, of themselves. So yeah, it's the mandatory face to face is important. I would also Absolutely. add that the face to face sessions, the face to face sessions are recorded, so you can go back and watch them afterwards. However, there are plenty of occasions where that recording has a problem or a technical glitch, and if you don't show up, you you've missed out on that, and you cannot rely on those. They're an added bonus if you need them. Um, but absolutely the value of attending face to face and talking with your peers and the breakout sessions where people go and have a chat. It's um, it's so much better than just watching a lecture online. And um, if you miss them, yeah, we will be chasing you because everybody has to sign in every day and, and we'll check. <laughs> um, I think uh, with when I asked some people, some current students, they said that the course is carried out in three different campuses. And yes. I assume that um, all the information will be given in due course so that no one has to like complain about um, not knowing whether the venue is for the lectures or such. And exactly. Such, right? So we try and do it months in advance because we not only is that, you know, inconvenient for a regular student, it is really difficult for people who are trying to juggle clinical duties, for example. You know, if you have to actually know that you've got to go all the way to the Hammersmith campus for a week. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, you do get to see all of the the uh, imperial campuses. The 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 bias right now is towards South Kensington and the Brompton, um, but that's because most of our module leaders are there, so they get to say where the module will be run. Perfect. Okay, and uh, one remaining question. So for personal, individual, case uh, specific basises, bases. For example, like me, I'm currently in my last year of bachelor and um, I have an offer and I need to get a certain grade to um, finalize the offer. So whom mm -hmm. should I contact for like specific questions? Because for example, I, I'm studying in Germany and uh, my examiners are 
kind of slow when it comes to marking and there could be, you know, for, for, for questions like these, who should I contact? I'm not really sure. You could try our education officer, office, try our director of education, whose name is Rachel Breen, B-R-E-E-N. She will know where to refer you to. Okay. Okay, you can uh, easily find her. Um, she's at her NHLI. Title, her, she's education manager. Right? Okay. And, and formerly, actually, was one of our GM administrators, uh, genomic medicine, so she knows her stuff. She will know who to refer you to. Okay. Uh, and just one last question for the final part of the uh, masters, we have to do this research project. And does it make sense to, for example, in my first few months in London to seek out someone uh, to a supervisor for my research project rather than to, you know, last minute it or? You certainly don't want to leave it last minute. So you want to do it proactively, but you don't have to jump in the first week. I would say, you know, if you have something nailed down in the first few months of the calendar year, so you're going to start in October and you're going to sort of, you know, get your footing and then you might actually hear some lectures or or see some topics that you want to pursue. Uh, some people will come in with it already figured out in their mind, so it's up to you and we will give as much help as possible. So if you tell us that you're interested in a particular thing, we will go out and try and find the people who can give you those projects. Perfect. Thank you for the answers to all my questions. OK, great. All right. And and uh, nice to see you again. Um, Irene. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, I. Oh, no, and Nicholas is off. OK, so Irene, yes, yes. Yes, perfect. Um, first thing, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I just have a couple of questions, if that's OK. So mm -hmm. um, I recently graduated last year. I did an M bio on genetics. And my main concern is if this master's is going to, is it specific enough for me to like, you know, like broaden my knowledge because um, I'm very interested in genetics. So I was thinking or I was wondering if you know of any other people that came from a genetics background or uh, dozens. Any recommendations? Yes, we have had, you know, literally dozens of people who have genetics degrees. Genomics and genomic medicine is quite distinct from genetics. Um, so although it's nice to have a genetics background, it's not going to teach you about how particular genome technologies can be employed or mm -hmm. it's not going to teach you much. Well, unless you've gone to an ex exceptional program, a lot of bioinformatics. Uh, this stuff does really cover the waterfront of genomic medicine. And um, and that is quite a distinct thing. So you're not going to get the same old stuff that you had in a gen genetics degree. That's great to hear, honestly. Um, also, would it be like a focus on like clinical research and clinical studies? No, in the modules. No, not that much. Uh, there are, you know, examples, but it's not a matter of you know parading patients by you and 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 some you know some lecturers like to get into the the sort of the the clinical um, interaction uh, aspects of genomic medicine and that's interesting and it actually does sort of diversify your perspective but we're very much into science and we're very much into genomic medicine uh, as a <laughs> understanding it rather than being superficial about it. So that's okay. the type of intensity you'll get. OK, yeah, that's that's great to hear. Um, just a last question very quickly. Um, yep. In the case of getting an interview, will it be like a technical interview or more like what's your motivation to apply to these masters? Well, it's a bit of everything. So I can tell you exactly what the format of the interview would be. It would be a series of questions about why you want to do this. And and we, we may, you know, ad lib into other things there. And then we will have, we'll send you a paper. And we will discuss the, the content of the paper and we will ramble far and wide in that uh, because we're not there to do a journal club on it. We're there to hear if you've understood it and what your impressions and opinions are. And then the last bit is you asking us questions. Uh, if you still have any about the program. So 
it, it can be quite wide reaching, but it's not technical in the sense that we're giving you a set um, task to accomplish or something like that. OK. OK, thank you so much. That answer everything. Thank OK, you. great. Now, and then we have somebody who I can only see as S.A. here. Sorry, uh, sorry to disturb again. Um, mm -hmm. I just got another doubt like, you know, uh, genomic medicine, what you described is like uh, research oriented and everything. Mm -hmm. So I have seen NHS uh, doing some genomic counseling. So is there any way that, that the course you're learning will help into genomic counseling as well? Yeah, yeah a lot of people, a lot of people come in with the motivation to do uh, genomic counselling after they've done uh, a genomic medicine degree and a lot of them do and I think that's okay. a, a good training scheme because understanding the limitations of of the technology and understanding the approaches is critical to knowing how the output um, mm. you know measures real genetic risk we do mm -hmm. have one module called genomics and the patient it is the closest thing to counselling that we teach Mm -hmm. uh, in which you you do actually interact with with people and you have to present a case. OK, to, uh, but in general, I mean, you get to interact with an awful lot of physicians who are doing this as a living. You know, they okay. are real. They are real, uh, you know, medical scientists um, okay. and they're doing what I would consider as genomic medicine. Um, but we're not going to be teaching you how to be gen genomic counselors. Okay. Yeah. OK, that's fine. Thank you. OK. All right. So I see. SA, whatever SA stands for. <laughs> yeah, hi. Can't hear you yet. You're muted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, oh, right. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for your talk. Um, my name is uh, Sinan. I'm a, a locum pharmacist working in the NHS, mainly in, in, the, in the NHS hospitals. And um, I just, I, know, I probably know the answer to this, but I just want to check what are the, you've talked to quite a lot about funding streams and you said something about people working full time in the NHS. Does that include people who uh, perhaps are working independently and not within uh, like fixed NHS contracts? I think you probably need a fixed NHS contract. I'd have to check on that. But okay. why don't you shoot an email to Lawrence, or, uh, which is genomics at Imperial or whatever it's called, oh, and ask Sorry, just, him. Just one minute, sorry. Hello? Yeah. Okay. I'll sort it out. No. Sorry. Yeah, go on. Sorry. Yeah, so ask him if you if you if you actually require a, uh, a an NHS full time contract, and I'm pretty sure you do. So, okay. And with regards to, um, so I'm working quite a lot in various specialties in the NHS, um, and it, obviously um, drug therapy. Is are these uh, modules um, linked to? Like recent advances in 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 genomics regarding treatment of patients in oncology or in other like disciplines. Yes, yeah, very much so. And we have a pharmacogenomics, uh, you know, optional module, which certainly focuses on that route. But you'd find in in the cancer module and in various other ones, there there will be discussions of targeted therapies. Right. I see. Okay. All right, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. OK, all right. OK, and I. Anybody else? I think that Rania is we just talked to. Yes, yes. Thank you. Anybody else? Got another 15 minutes, so I, I think we have anyway, so. We're very happy to answer your questions. For anybody who is considering from an HEE background, from an NHS background uh, for applying, my recommendation is to do it fairly soon because okay. we will we'll start to 
be making some tough decisions in in the next month or two. Uh, okay. So uh, we will we will in the next week we will be deciding upon apportioning funding for our current students going from certs to diplomas and diplomas to MSCs. Okay. And then we'll start to uh, apportion the money to the people on hold. And in past years, HEE have been extremely good about this because we have a lot of very well qualified applicants and they've actually given us extra money above and beyond the. Uh, but that's not going to continue forever, especially in this economic climate. Um, yeah. OK, thank you. All right. I'll do that. I do see some names I recognize amongst the people sitting there. Hello, Professor Lowit. I'm I'm Oshan. I have I, I know I, I remember you. We've we, we yeah. I think uh, so, uh, uh, professors who have already. Whoops, say again. So I've already heard from the, from Lawrence that uh, I've been chosen from the academic program, but I have not heard from the college as of yet. Yes, well, I was just filling out forms for you. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that's probably their hold up. So you should be hearing from them imminently. I mean, within the next week. Yes, yeah. so, yeah, it, it's in the works, that's for sure. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Anybody else? Don't be bashful. If you've got a question, go ahead and ask. Hi again. Hi. Um. So I was wondering about the modules. Will we will we be in touch with like um, coding like R or Linux, or will it be from like a base level or more like proficiency? What is it? You mean in terms of bioinformatics? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So you learn. Um, I mean, a month-long module is not going to make you a card-carrying bioinformatician, but you are going to learn. Uh, quite a bit of R. You're going to learn some Python. You're going to learn some Unix. Um, mm -hmm. We're not. We don't do. I don't think C plus plus or anything like that. But you know, you learn command line languages, and you and you uh, get to apply them to various bioinformatic problems. And you also get you know introduced to things like Plink and various ways of analysis and and obviously pathogenicity calling on mutations. Um, but it's more to demystify it and to make and to facilitate you doing stuff um, than to make you, uh, you know, uh, as I said, a card carrying bioinformatician. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great to hear because that was my main concern. Also, it's it sounds so complicated, so. Well, yeah, yeah but, you know, it's not rocket science. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> It's, sure. uh, bioinformaticians would like to make you think it's rocket science, but it's it's not quite. Um, and our philosophy is we we're taking people who 
probably have never even seen a command line before. You know, people who have a Mac and have never ever realized what the terminal program is. Um, so, you know, which is the guts of the whole thing. Uh, so we're trying to demystify and empower at the same time. Great. Loli, thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Pleasure. Well, if there's no more questions, then I think what we'll do is sign off. I look forward to seeing, hopefully, all of you in the fall, in, in October. If you have already got an offer on hand, then look forward to seeing you. Definitely. Thank you. <laughs> OK, all right. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you. Have a good day. Right. Bye bye. Have a good day.